I'm David Tower and welcome to the Theories of Everything program. Over the past few months viewers we've been examining some big questions, some big questions of existence. We categorised the sorts of topics in this series according to whether they were physical questions about the universe or the nature of reality, its building blocks, its past and its future. Whether they were questions about life, how life began and how it might evolve in the future. Questions about the mind, about consciousness, about subjectivity. So this series is a work in progress. It will be continuously updated as the evidence flows in. The evidence obviously is vital in developing all theories. Theories that develop over time, there's usually a number of contenders, they compete against each other. Um, eventually the evidence for one overwhelms the others. And so the process goes on. That theory may eventually be modified as Newton's was by Einstein's relativity theories uh, in the future, and no doubt will, as not, but that doesn't mean that those original theories were valueless. They provide great value as Newton's theory does today. But as the boundaries of our knowledge widen, it's essential that we take into account new parameters that may feed in and improve those theories in a wider context. We've examined about four of these big questions to date. We examined, for example, the nature of reality. And the latest theories provide some very interesting answers to this. They all seem to converge on the fact that at the bottom of space-time, at the bottom building block of matter, there exists information and energy flowing through causal, quantized networks, for example. We tackle the future of life. And again, some of the signposts are quite clear because we can already see the influence of the computer on our lives and artificial intelligence to improve decision making. So there's a symbiosis going on there and there's a cooperative symbiosis through the internet. Being able to cooperate with others to solve difficult problems, being constantly in touch with others provides a sort of a super organism scenario. We looked at the matrix type problem, the simulation problem, and decided that there's a possibility we could be living in a matrix. Because humans are already working towards that end. We're developing sophisticated internet virtual reality games. We're starting to incorporate all the senses, not just vision. And we're producing some quite realistic results. Of course, these are just games and playthings compa compared with simulating a real society, real humans, a real universe. But if you consider that some civilizations, if they exist, may well be 500 or 1,000 years in advance of us, and if they're proceeding along the same technological lines, then their capability would be incredibly massive and quite capable of generating the information and energy needed to uh, simulate lifelike forms, a lifelike universe. We can, from our current knowledge, look at scenarios that aren't entirely implausible. And this is, as I mentioned in this series, extremely valuable for the present. We have to continuously assess the future to improve our present. So there are a number of stumbling blocks. If we return, for example, to the universe, which we will do in this current two program series on dark matter and dark energy. These are two major stumbling blocks for cosmologists at the moment in understanding the universe. Because it appears that only a small amount of the matter that we see around us um, constitutes a small percentage of matter in the universe, around 5%. Uh, another large lump is something that we don't know but know it exists. Um, that accounts for about 25% and again around the rest of it the rest of mass energy is accounted for by this dark energy, this expansionary anti-gravity force that seems to be pushing our cosmos, ripping our cosmos apart. So to order, in order to understand the full picture of the universe, its shape, its density, its beginnings, its evolution, these two problems have to be solved and they are well on the way to being solved as we'll see in the program. Cosmologists, you see, astrophysicists, are a bit like Sherlock Holmes. 
They painstakingly gather their evidence and then make inferences from that. The inferences are original hypotheses or original theories. And then they constantly tune those. They gather more evidence. They gather evidence from the light coming from the universe, from stars, from planets. Um, they gather information by telescopes and spectrometers and particle colliders. They put it all together and they make better inferences. They wait for more evidence, better instruments in space, gathering gamma ray information, whatever it is, and add it into the models and improve the models and very doggedly and creatively push on until a theory or a group of theories emerge that can put that, uh, put that position fairly solidly, the one that they're looking for. And uh, this goes on and on, and it goes on, it's a model for all the sciences. What's happening in cosmology happens in biology and psychology and archaeology and all the other major sciences, and it's a cooperative effort. So in these two programs, again, we'll be examining in this program the nature of dark matter and the current theories relating to it, and in our next program, the nature of dark energy. So what do cosmologists currently know about the composition of the universe? Well, it's taken a long time to piece this together, to get this far, but they, they're now fairly confident that they can break up the components into three categories. As described, briefly, first of all, ordinary matter, and again that constitutes, they believe, around 5% of the total mass energy in the universe. Ordinary matter is the stuff that's... Uh, defined in the standard model of physics. It's protons, neutrons, mesons, electrons, neutrinos, etc. And it's the stuff that feels the four forces. It feels the electromagnetic force, it feels gravity, it feels the strong and nuclear. It's influenced by the strong and weak nuclear forces. So that's all standard stuff, but unfortunately it doesn't, um, it doesn't quite gel with the physics of the cosmos. Galaxies rotate at quite a speed. Um, and when they do, there's forces applied which would normally fling those stars and components of a galaxy out into space if they weren't held together by gravity. Unfortunately, there's not nearly enough gravity to hold those stars together as they move around. And in fact, uh, Again, there's about just a fraction of what's required. And from the, from the understanding of the number of the quantity of matter, the quantity of stars uh, in, a, in, a, in a galaxy, and of course, not just in individual galaxies, but clumps of galaxies, um, it can be inferred that there's around about a fifth of what's required, or a sixth of what's required to hold those uh, dynamic entities together. Now, the rest is what's put in the basket, the hard basket of dark matter, the other 25%, because it's concluded now that around about 30% in total uh, of mass energy is made up of ordinary matter and exotic types of matter called dark matter. The other 70% is in the form of energy. Uh, again, that's uh, a form of anti-gravity, a form of... Uh, force that seems to be expanding the universe ad infinitum. So what makes up that other 25 percent? Well we'll go into that in detail in the next section of the program but basically it's particles that were formed at the beginning of the universe and are still around but they don't obviously don't feel the same forces as ordinary baronic matter. In other words they they certainly feel gravity because they've clumped together. Uh, and by the way, that's another piece of evidence for the, for the existence of dark matter. The tiny fluctuations that formed the seeds of galaxies at the beginning weren't, didn't allow enough time for those galaxies to form with the current amount of matter that we see today in the time frame that's been available. So additional matter was required to bring those initial fluctuations to the form of to large-scale galaxies. In this particular case, as I said, there are probably around about 20 different theories. Of those, there's half a dozen relating to ordinary matter. Some of them are on the brink of being washed out already, such as the failed star-type objects, for example. 
it's understood that ordinary matter uh, it's understood now that there was a certain amount of primordial matter created at the big bang and only a certain amount and to jump from 5% to 30% using all these uh, forms of, of ordinary matter just won't cut the mustard because if there were that many protons and neutrons formed at the beginning there would have been more heavier elements and the, the ratio of heavier elements just doesn't stand up in the current, to the current measurements in the, of the current universe. So therefore there couldn't be a whole host of burnt out stars and objects such as that, failed planets etc roaming around, there are a certain number but nowhere near, perhaps they might account for 0.5 of a percent towards that 25 percent but not enough to account for the bulk of it. But there are some other interesting ordinary matter theories, one recently that came up was uh, that there are vast clouds of cold hydrogen in space that are very difficult to detect. They haven't been detected because they don't shine, they can't be picked up by normal methods. Um, now these vast clouds of hydrogen also make up some of the filaments that join galaxies together or are certainly involved in the chemistry of those filaments. Again very difficult to pick up in a very interesting phenomenon which may lead to other theories and other breakthroughs. But again it looks like there could not have been enough of this primordial gas to increase the levels from 5% to anywhere near 30%. So um, again there's even more interesting theories. One of these relates to cosmology in the large. It relates to the fact that this universe appears to be a three-dimensional, in the form of a three-dimensional membrane, perhaps floating within higher dimensions, within a five or six membrane meta-universe. And in fact our universe may be folded over many times. So not only may there be other universes and other brains within this higher dimensional space, but there may be other parts of the universe very of our universe very close to us in this multiple folding process. Very close indeed, but we can't see because we're on the surface, a three-dimensional surface, if you like, of this vast membrane. However, the effects, the gravitational effects of matter, are very close to our galaxies could, would be felt. It would take a shortcut, if you like, through those many folds and would uh, contribute to the total gravity of a, of a, of a galaxy because there'd be a, another galaxy mimicking our galaxy in those folds nearby. So we would feel the effect of ordinary matter where our galaxies would. So that's one theory that hasn't, it's fairly speculative, but it hasn't been knocked out at this stage because there's a whole host of stuff, as we'll see in the next uh, program, relating to higher dimensions and higher dimensional impacts. We'll also see that this comes into our next set of theories, our second set of theories. So now, viewers, we come to the main core of theories, theories relating to so-called exotic particles or WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles and this is uh, comes under the name of cold dark matter. Cold dark matter varies from warm matter in that it doesn't travel so fast. Warm matter is usually applied to particles such as neutrinos that, that, uh, that travel almost at the speed of light. Uh, cold or lesser speedy particles are able to therefore to clump together better and create these, uh, create these halos to our visible galaxies. Now again, where do, these, where do these particles arise? What's the evidence? Well, at the beginning, at the Big Bang, uh, it, there appears to have been a large number of different particles way beyond the particles that are included in our so-called standard model of physics. Beyond uh, quarks and electrons and neutrinos and so forth, um, these additional particles 
are attributed within later theories such as string theory that says that particles come about through the vibration of energy and can take many many forms. Um, in the early days the Kaluza and Klein postulated a theory that said there were higher dimensions and that these higher dimensions could be the key to integrating the different forces notably gravity with electromagnetism initially. Uh, these theories of higher dimensions have been continuously developed as I say into current string theory which postulates around 11 dimensions but also into the general class of supersymmetric theories. Supersymmetric theories postulate that there are a large number also of uh, additional dimensions, um, perhaps five or six, that allow different particles to exist. So these particles exist in higher dimensions and they vibrate and they echo around these dimensions and some of these particles may still exist. Supersymmetric theory also says that for every particle that we, aren't, we know um, there exists a partner particle, a super particle that's much heavier and therefore hasn't been discovered yet by our, uh, in our atom smashers, our current set of atom smashers that work at certain energy levels. Um, the next generation of um, colliders will be able perhaps to find these particles. But there's a strong amount of evidence to suggest that these Kalitsa Klein particles, these exotic particles, do exist in some form or another. And one of the most uh, solid candidates for dark matter is a particle called neutralinos. Not neutrinos, it's, there's no relationship between the two. Uh, but neutralinos are a super particle, or a sparticle as they're sometimes called, that um, combines the super partner of a photon with the super partner of, a weak, of the weak nuclear force, a Z-force particle. Somehow these two amalgamate into one particular particle called a neutralino, and that is the lightest of these super particles. Therefore it can't decay, therefore it's still around, probably. It can't lose its kinetic energy either because it doesn't feel the electromagnetic force. It feels gravity, it feels probably the weak nuclear force. Uh, doesn't feel this, probably doesn't feel the strong nuclear force or electromagnetism. Therefore, it could be around and it's, as I say, it's a strong candidate. It's not the only candidate of these, for, for this type of exotic particle, but it's the, it's the one that seems to have grabbed physicists, and cosmologists the most. Now, even at this level, viewers, there's a number of contenders within this group that, that, that because of one major problem, if you like, in the theory. And this often happens. Theories develop, everyone gets very keen on them, everyone gets behind them, large numbers of postdoctoral students enter the field, um, it gets a, a momentum of it in its own sort of right and suddenly there's a, one piece of evidence drops in that blows the whole thing or potentially could blow the whole thing to smithereens and the theories are frantically amended uh, in the hope of retaining all that work that's gone into them and all, not to mention all the careers that have gone into their development uh, but sometimes unfortunately those theories are washed away other times modifications can save the day now this piece of evidence was the fact that under most conditions these particles, this dark matter particle should, these dark matter particles should aggregate towards the centre of a galaxy. The density should increase toward the centre. In fact in the centre there would be a sort of a cusp of high density of these, of these particles because the more grab, the more force the more they would draw other particles in. Unfortunately, when the centre of galaxies was examined for this level of density of uh, uh, dark matter, uh, and it can be measured in various ways, which I won't go into, primarily the speed of hydrogen going through a Doppler effect, uh, it was found that there was no such cusp. There were sort of broad plateaus, so suddenly everyone had to stop in their tracks and look for alternatives. 
and about five different alternatives are now uh, on the drawing board. And others are saying, though, that the astronomical observations of the centre of galaxies were wrong. In other words, the, the level of accuracy of the measurement was wrong. There is a cusp, but it just wasn't measured very accurately. Um, some of the options are, for example, that were mentioned is this, that some of these particles do feel the strong nuclear force and therefore repel each other. Therefore, if they get too close together, they, if you like, their density reduces. Um, others, alternatives are that some of these particles are warm, they're very fast and therefore escape the galactic core. Others that are like radioactive particles and decay, so that again they don't build up that density. Others that are very fuzzy and light, and uh, just sort of amorphize across the, across the galaxy at the quantum level and others that explode on contact, like matter and antimatter. So these are some of the options within that group of WIMP-type theories, but it looks very strongly as if there are exotic particles that do account for this hidden mass, but they've just got to be pinned down. The third class of series relates not so much as the new type of dark matter, but basically says there is no dark matter at all. The stuff out there that you see is what you get. What's changed is the laws of physics that have previously summed the relationships up between forces and acceleration and masses and gravity. And those theories have been primarily Newton's. So the new th this new hypothesis called the Mond hypothesis, or modification of Newtonian dynamics, says basically that there are some variations that occur at the galactic level in Newton's theories. Newton postulated two basic theories, one relating to gravity, which relates the force of gravity to the masses involved in the distance between them, and the sec Newton's second law, which relates force to mass and acceleration. Um, now these two laws have been drastically, or Newton's dynamics uh, mechanics, have been drastically revised before, first by Einstein's relativity theories, the special relativity theory, and the general relativity theory. One uh, modifying Newton's gravitational theories and the other modifying his relationship between force and acceleration. The other modifications are to do with uh, physics at the very small subparticle level, quantum physics. So in both cases these are extremes that were not considered in Newton's time. Newton's theories are very good for modelling the dynamics of a cruise missile or the orbits of planets, but not so good perhaps when it comes to modelling the dynamics of galaxies. And this is again where Mond comes in, and the Mond theory says that as you get to the outskirts of galaxies, uh, which can be hundreds of thousands of light years across, you get variations in the acceleration. Um, not velocity, but acceleration, which is very tiny actually at the outskirts of a galaxy, compared with, say, the acceleration of the space shuttle heading towards the Earth. This acceleration actually, uh, once it passes this particular threshold defined in the Mond theory, it uh, drops off to a very, very small level. Um, so in the original Newton's theory, force is proportional to acceleration, and in the Mond theory, it's proportional to acceleration squared. And also velocity is proportion to the, proportional to the fourth root of the mass, which is another variation. So <clears throat> basically it says at that level, at that very tiny level of acceleration, you don't need to worry. You have need far less force, you need far less gravity, and you need far less mass, which means you don't need any extra matter. So this is very interesting. A lot of physicists are very both uh, concerned about this theory but also intrigued by it and it'll be very interesting to see which class of these three theories ordinary matter theories even including exotic types of matter from other parts of the universe um, the new type of particles primarily the neutralino and the new, th new Newtonian theories or the new theories of gravity and acceleration um, now what does what does all this mean? It means that these 
theories will be pursued till again there's a winner or a class of winners. But it also means much more viewers. It means that, first of all, this pursuit of knowledge in this area is leading to a greater understanding of building blocks of reality, greater understanding of new types of particles, and also greater understanding of the potential for greater, more dimensions in the universe, such as postulated in supersymmetry theory and in string theory. Um, it also means there's probably a major relationship of some sort between the cosmos in the large and the physical laws, such as Newton's, at the, at the local level. There's some sort of relationship going on and no one's quite sure of how that relationship works, but obviously it's the same as inertia. Inertia isn't an intrinsic property of an object, it's a relationship with the universe, between the universe and the object as a whole. So these are very interesting times indeed and we'll look forward on this show to bringing you constant updates as this incredible story continues to unfold. I'm David Tower and you've been watching the Theories of Everything program. I'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, not velocity, but acceleration, which is very tiny actually at the outskirts of a galaxy compared